So I have about 10 minutes to talk about what may be the single most powerful and significant book, not just in the Western world, but in all of human history. Great. I should maybe start by expanding on that claim. First, by glancing at the most obvious competition, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, otherwise known as the Synoptic Gospels. The fact that they're called Synoptic, coming from the Greek words for viewing together, is already hint as to where I'm going with this. It's commonly accepted that Mark was written first, and then Matthew and Luke borrowed from him and from some other places, essentially copying his homework but changing a bit so it didn't look like they cheated. The consequence is that almost all of Mark is replicated in Matthew and Luke, who then share about a quarter of their remaining content with each other. Basically, early Christian Hollywood figured out what worked and just kept pumping out repetitive sequels. John, however, is his own special snowflake. Tradition holds that the John in question is John the Apostle, the youngest of the twelve apostles and the only one not to be brutally martyred, making it no surprise that his gospel was also one of the last biblical books to be written around 95 AD, when John was probably in his 80s. By this point, the other three gospels would have been in circulation for some time, and not only was John familiar with them, but he assumed everyone else was too. Evidently seeing no point in beating a resurrected horse, John chose to omit huge swaths of material available in his precursors, skipping over major events like the Transfiguration and practically all of Jesus' parables. No, John was after something more fundamental and intimate than the other evangelists, and the result is a book which is 90% original material. It's worth observing that if John had wanted to write something in the old vein but still be original, he definitely could have, and would have been even more qualified than the other evangelists. It's generally accepted that John anonymizes his own appearances in his gospel by calling himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, which on its own implies a pretty special relationship. And if we trust that assumption and the accounts of the other gospel writers, we learn how deep that relationship went. John, along with James and Peter, was one of the only disciples to witness the transfiguration and the agony in the garden. He recounts himself as leaning on Jesus' breast during his last Passover meal and was the only apostle not to abandon him during the crucifixion. In consequence, Christ entrusted John with the care of his mother Mary before his death, which means that John probably spent years learning the intimate details of Jesus' life before his public ministry just from hanging around her. On top of everything else, John, unlike the others, had already tried his hand at this whole scripture writing thing, having authored the book of Revelations not long before. No one was in a better position to give us the inside scoop on the life of Christ, and John didn't let that opportunity go to waste. He did, however, give us a very different view than what we would expect. So enough about what John didn't write, what did he write? Well, the Gospel of John is typically divided in two parts. The first 12 chapters are the Book of Signs, named after a series of seven miracles which Jesus performs, the most famous being the resurrection of Lazarus. The remaining nine chapters are called the Book of Glory, where John describes the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, notably devoting a considerable chunk of the book to a speech that Jesus gives to the apostles at the Last Supper, which is largely absent from the other Gospels. Throughout the book, you get the sense that John is much more theologically and mystically inclined than the other evangelists, skimming over the narrative and going heavy on the discourses and conversations. In fact, John actually gives us the longest conversation Jesus has with any individual in the Gospels with the story of the woman at the well. But of all this talking, of all the words that come out of Jesus' mouth, there are two that John can't seem to get enough of. I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate, the good shepherd, the resurrection, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the vine. These are the seven most famous I am statements that Jesus makes in his gospel. But John throws in a truckload of others, giving us both a highly explicit hint as to what he's trying to get at, and, more dangerously, the foundations for a very interesting drinking game. While I do not actually advise anyone to play this game, I like to believe that this is why they ran out of wine at Cana. I think that we as moderns can get hung up on the moral teachings of Jesus, and I mean that regardless of whether or not we like them. We tend to have tunnel vision both for take up your cross just as much as the ever popular judge not lest ye be judged. Now don't get me wrong, I think John wants us to take these things seriously. Jesus didn't take a whip to the crowd in the temple because he was chill about a little vice here and there. However, there's evidence in John that he thinks morality is more of a secondary concern, exhibit A being that he barely ever talks about it. When he does bring up moral exhortations, the commands themselves are fairly broad. John 15, 12 takes this to the extreme, boiling down all human morality into one simple rule. This is my commandment, that you love one another. However, what John decides to emphasize, to flourish and shout from the rooftops, is the remainder of that sentence, as I have loved you. <laughs> 
In context, it's clear that Jesus is not simply saying that they should consider his example. Instead, Jesus cites himself as the reason that they should love each other. He's not merely claiming to be the gold standard for good behavior, he's saying that he's the underlying reason love is worthwhile in the first place. For John, morality only holds water because moral principles flow from the very nature of Christ, which of course begs John's favorite question. Who exactly is he? This is why John is so obsessed with I am statements. He believes that not only morality, but life, the universe, and everything is only intelligible in the light of who Jesus is. And whenever Jesus gives us an I am statement, it's another hint into that mystery. And John is willing to beg, borrow, and steal for whatever clues he can get. The most obvious source he draws from is his own Jewish tradition, as all of these I am's are a pretty clear reference to the book of Exodus, where God reveals his name to Moses as I am who am. However, John also calls in Greek philosophy to help bear the load, when he calls Jesus the word in his opening verses. The Greek word he drafts for the occasion is logos, which comes along with a connotation of a universal reason, or a principle by which all other things are illuminated and bound together. The term had been floating around Greek philosophy for at least 500 years before John, and in more recent times the philosopher Philo had adopted it for application within a Jewish context. By adapting it in his gospel, John implicitly gave all Christians henceforward the green light to use not only faith, but reason to try to discover the person John believed was reason himself. Yet it's important to clarify that John isn't content with sitting in an armchair knowing things about Jesus. You have to imagine him sort of like an awkward high schooler with a stupidly huge crush, rifling through every terribly captioned Instagram pic and long forgotten Facebook post for any additional scrap of detail about the one he loves. But even if he were to find everything available, even if he could write all the books which the world could not contain, he would still be miserably unhappy until he actually talked to the object of his affections. Thinking about them without encountering them would only add to his torment. The John we've been painting a picture of may be that of a contemplative and mystic, but moderation and restraint were not his strong suits. The Gospel of Mark says that Jesus named him and his brother James the Sons of Thunder, and Luke recounts that they once asked Jesus if they should call down fire from heaven to destroy a town because they couldn't find a room for the night. Thankfully, Jesus let it slide. He was the only one crazy enough to stick around at the crucifixion when the Romans could have easily found another cross just his size, and in his own gospel, he recounts himself sprinting to Jesus' tomb after the resurrection, even outpacing Peter, perhaps the most infamously impulsive and brash man in the Bible. At every moment, John shows us that he is desperate for Christ, and that he is not a man of half measures. He never reaches the point where he feels he has a sufficiently intimate knowledge of him, and he always waits with bated breath for that next I am. John does not simply want a knowledge of Christ, but to be in love with Christ, at the expense of all else. This is why the Gospel of John stands above any other book for its potency and relevance. Even above the other Gospels, John spells out more clearly than anyone else that the fundamental insight he has into the nature of reality is not a principle but a person, and no other book demands our engagement with that person so urgently. John insists that we search for Christ with the whole of our intellect and will, applying philosophy, faith, and above all love to the problem. He contends that our very ability to live depends on it, for these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John died at Ephesus in modern-day Turkey around 100 AD, but even beforehand the young church was fracturing under the weight of the question of Christ's nature. Practically all of the schisms and heresies that would rack Christianity for the next few centuries would revolve around this mystery, and even explaining the difference between the positions would take more time than we can afford at this point. We moderns are often tempted to look back on such theological controversies and think that we've risen above that now, and that we've learned to put aside questions of doctrine so long as we can all play nice together. I think John would take issue with that though. I think he would say that those early Christians, even those he would have considered heretics, were the ones with the priorities straight, because they realized that the crux of the matter was not so much about what was true, but about who exactly was the truth. John, of course, was not the only man in the Roman Empire to write about someone who claimed divine sonship and sought to establish a new kingdom on earth. So I hope you subscribe to the Rosamond Project, because next time we'll sing of arms and of another such man with Virgil's Aeneid.